weirdos. I love it. That's awesome. You know, um, it's, it's stories like that. It's testimonies like that uh, that should encourage all of us. It can be done. And uh, we get to we get to talk a bit about finances today, which is which is awesome. So, uh, debt free, pregnant, God's working, and uh, how exciting is that? So, uh, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter twelve, is where we're going to be this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, this time of year, there's you know we're twelve days away from Christmas. Is that wild or what? And I have yet to do any shopping, which is crazy. And the worst part about Christmas, let's be honest, is wrapping. It's not like wrapping presents at all awful right and to make it worse i was in a fam i grew up in a family where my brother got a job with neiman marcus and they professionally trained him how to wrap presents so when my brother's presents come to the come to the table listen like all of ours is like they're horrible they're horrible we're like let me guess that's my brother's wrap yeah it's his wrapping job meticulous perfect Perfect. Always just spot on. It's like, oh, here comes a Neiman Marcus professionally trained, tra- trained gift wrapper, huh? Well, it's interesting. A study was recently done about the quality of our wrapping jobs. And here's what the study covered. That how the good the wrapping is on the gift will determine the recipient's attitude toward the gift. Meaning, the messier the outside the more the person loves the gift on the inside. The nicer the wrapping, the more disappointed they are with the gift inside. So the outside sets an expectation. So what I am encouraging is horrible wrapping jobs this year. Amen? And I was thinking about this. I was like, how interesting. Like you approach a gift and it looks like a Charlie Brown Christmas present maybe, right? And the person that unwraps an ugly wrapped job gift is actually more excited about what the gift is on the inside. The nicer, the more meticulous it is, the less excited the person is about the gift on the inside. So the outside sets an expectation. Well, isn't that true spiritually of our lives? I think the messier we are on the outside, the, the, the more joyful we are to discover what's on the inside. Meaning, if we put a facade up, like everything's perfect, the more people get the noise, maybe they're more disappointed that you're not all you set out to portray yourself as. And I can't think of a better area of this than when it comes to our finances. <laughs> and how about specifically the topic of greed? See, greed is one of those interesting things that the Bible addresses because we all deal with it. Greed isn't just someone who has lots and lots of money who wants more. Greed can exist in the person that has nothing. See, greed is dangerous because we're so often so blind to it. And Jesus this morning in Luke 12 is going to, he's going to pull back the wrapping paper of our lives and discover that we're all pretty weak in this area. That we all need to come before God and perhaps have a little bit of heart work done when it comes to this topic of greed. Here's the thing. We live in the most affluent of all nations in the world. And yet we're the ones who are probably the stingiest the most when it comes to finances. Always thinking we don't have enough. We're spending 118% of our income. Think about that. We're spending 118% of our income, meaning you're spending more than you make. We are the worst of the, of the developed nations in the world when it comes to savings. The Germans save 10%. You know how much we save? Negative 0.5%. But yet, God holds us accountable to, to, to honor certain things first more than we, we look out for ourselves, our careers, our comfort, our ease, our security. See, every year we talk about finances just before Christmas. Why? Because this is my Christmas present to you. Now, for some of you, it might be a little bit too late this year. But I want you to begin to understand that this is not about what God wants from you. This is about what God wants for you. I love talking about finances. No problem. I know pastors are like, I got to talk about money. I'm like, really? And they're like, you're weird. Because Jesus talked about money more than he talked about any other topic. Matter of fact, a third of the parables Jesus told have to do with money. See, money is an indicator of where our hearts are at. 
And, th- and this is the topic. See, cre- greed has nothing to do with owning possessions or having wealth. Greed has to do with the position of your heart of what you do with the things that God has given to you. See, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to give you a few verses today. Hebrews 13 reminds us of this, and this is why this is so important. Keep your life free from the love of money. Why? Because he wants you to be content with what you have. For, the, for, for God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Meaning, money leaves you and forsakes you. And God says, here's what money promises, all the things that I promise you, except for what? Relationship. This is why Hebrews 13 is so powerful. This is why Paul wrote in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 these words. He said this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. In fact, write that phrase down, truly life. Money, possessions, wealth, all the things that we seek to accumulate promise us life. But in the end, they deceive us because they don't ultimately give us what is truly important. And that is what feeds our souls with eternity in view. Naked you came into this world. Guess how you're going to leave? Naked as well. Job. Thanks, Job, for sharing that with us. So this morning we get to talk about greed. We get to talk about the importance of coming before God. And I'm not saying that, and, and please, you're going you're to discover, God is not against success. He is not against wealth. He is not against the accumulation of, of stuff. So as we understand that there are more important priorities to keep in view. Even Spurgeon himself said, there is no trial like affluence. No trial like affluence. Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 13. So last week we got into, uh, you know, the fact that we are not to, to worry, that we have a God who, who's with us, who's going to defend us before the courts of angels, and <clears throat> how we are to free, live a life free from hypocrisy. Verse 13. So then someone in the crowd pipes up and says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he says to him, Man, and I'm sure how Jesus sounded, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to him, Beware and be on guard against every form of greed. Interesting phrase. Circle that in your Bible. your Bible. Every form of greed, meaning this is how deceitful greed is, it could take on different shapes and sizes. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told him a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my abundance, my crops? And he says, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is God's word. And sometimes I hate it. (laughs) Let's be honest. Jesus is taking a scalpel to each and every one of our hearts right here, right now. And we realize that this has nothing to do with the man who asked about the family inheritance or the parable. I read this and go, this has to do with me. Because Scott Morgan has a greedy heart. And yet the goal 
is not what God wants from us, but what he wants for us. And what does he want for us? Verse 21, he wants us to be rich toward God. There's the ultimate objective. There's the aim. There's the goal. We ought to be rich toward God, and we're going to talk about that here in a, in a moment. What does it mean to be rich toward God? But before we get there, let's, let's take this, this account apart. First thing we need to understand is that there's a request from greed. Verse 13. Jesus just got done talking about hypocrisy and, and God caring for us, right? Concerned about the sparrows and the hair falling from our heads. And, and, and this man has listened to everything Jesus said. And then he goes off and he has one, it's like a presidential press conference. I'm sure there's thousands of people, you know, just congregating in on Jesus. This guy shouts out, I mean, if you have only one question or one comment or one statement to make with Jesus, which, which question, which statement are you going to make? This guy, here's what he asks. Will you make my brother pay me my portion of the family inheritance? Really? Like you got, you got one thing to share with Jesus, and this is what it's going to be. Make my brother give me my fair share. Let me just tell you right now, a little background. If there's an inheritance to be divided... There's a death to be mourned. This man doesn't say, help me in my grief. Because I don't know where to go. This man doesn't say, my family is in, in turmoil over this. We're emotionally wrecked. We're spiritually empty. We don't, he doesn't ask for these things. He just wants someone to be an advocate on his behalf He's essentially saying there's something unfair that has happened with the family inheritance. And Jesus, I want you to step in and be an arbiter, to be an advocate, to make sure I get my fair share. I'm going to tell you right now, greed is always ugly. Greed is always ugly. And when it comes to our possessions, this is probably the most heartbreaking statement that I will make this morning. When possessions are the goal, people become the pawns. I have spent time with too many families, couples, situations where it has been about inheritances, it has been about wills, it has been about estates, it's been about divorces. It's, and let me just tell you, when the goal is money and possessions, you ruin so many relationships. This is why if you are going to leave behind something to your kids, you have a sit-down meeting, come to Jesus' time with the family so that they are able to hear your, your will, your wishes right from your lips rather than you dying and then leaving everybody in, in question and in turmoil. When possessions are the goal, people become the pawns. This man didn't care for his brother. He didn't care for his family. He only wanted what was due to him. And let me just tell you, this man's enemy is not his brother. When it comes to people in your life you may have disagreements with over finances or whatever, they are not your enemy. But yet the devil, he, he slithers in and he makes it about them being the enemy when in reality the enemy is your heart. The enemy is your heart. The enemy is this voracious sin that is devouring everyone involved. Because the brother's guilty too. Because obviously the brother's hoarding more than his share. And I think the brother is probably there by the, by the language of the, of the verses. The language it speaks to the fact that both brothers are there hearing Jesus' response. So it's not just the guy who was bold enough to ask the question. It's also the brother sitting there probably thinking, yeah, I took more than I, I should have. Number two, there's the response and wow, Jesus comes across so unloving. I love it. Sometimes you want to be Jesus to be unloving. Yeah, tell them what they need to hear, Jesus. Man, who made me arbiter or judge over you? Like, you just get the spice. You get the spice from what Jesus says. And, and I love it. And, and yet I hate it too. Because here's what you have to first acknowledge. Look at verse 14. He says, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? 
Jesus is literally saying, I just got done talking about some pretty significant things, and you're bringing up the fact that you didn't get your fair share of the family's inheritance. Jesus essentially says there's more important matters for me to tend to. And here is the convicting thought from this. We all want Jesus to serve us, but we rarely want Jesus to save us. Don't we want Jesus to settle all of our, all of our injustices? We want just Jesus to change all the people in our lives, and, and yet we want him to do our bidding, but we don't want him to take over our lives. Jesus, change my circumstances, but there's no prayer of Jesus, change my heart. See, Jesus is like, I did not come primarily to help divide family inheritances. I came, Jesus says, to divide you from your families when it comes to a, a commitment to me. Right? I mean, think about what Jesus said. He says some pretty harsh things even later in Luke chapter 12. I came to divide father from son, mother from daughter. Why? Because there's a division that is more important than your family inheritance, and it's this. Dividing you between you and your unrighteousness. You and your sin. It, it would have made this guy harder to save if Jesus had arbitered the situation with his brother and gave him his fair share of the family inheritance and yet still destined this man's soul to hell. It is dangerous when we serve people and, and not to save them. God could give us all we wanted to make our, our lives easier and car- comfortable in life, but he doesn't save us, then we're, that's eternally useless. Eternal life does not consist of what you own. John 17, 3. Eternal life is this, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Convicting? Raise your hand. Are are you with me in this camp? We always want Jesus to change our circumstances, change my husband, change my kids, change my boss, change my pastor. Can't stand that guy. Change everybody, but we don't say change me. Who am I to be arbiter over your situation when I exist to be the judge over your soul? Wow. Wow. Let Jesus be the advocate of your soul this morning. Life is not what you own, but who you are before God. But verse 15, look at it, it says, but beware. This is the only time Jesus uses this language. Beware. Meaning there is a, there's a power that exists within us which is a toxic substitute for what can truly satisfy. And what truly satisfies is is, is Jesus. All these things clamor for our attention in life. Our wealth, our possessions, our money, our jobs, what our homes, our cars, all the stuff we we own, we think it we own it, it owns us. And we think it satisfies, and Jesus says, you can't find satisfaction in stuff. You must find satisfaction in relationship and that relationships with God. So beware because you're coveting something that you think is going to bring you life, but it's not. This guy is destined to even more destruction if Jesus gives him what he wants. Not only is this inheritance not your life, pal, but it's about to take your life. Don't find your identity in this, right? It is a dead-end road. Even the most, and, and, and this is why I love the book of Ecclesiastes. If you've never read Ecclesiastes, this is, this is the book of the Bible given to us who tend to be a little more cynical. Any cynics out there? Cynicism, sarcasm, two of my favorite spiritual gifts God has given to me. So Ecclesiastes 5, look what Solomon says. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. It's vanity. It's, it's meaningless. It, it's a chasing after the wind. This is why... Paul, again in Timothy 6, verse 10, for the love of money, the thing that you want to treasure, 
And you, and you can only treasure one of two things. You can either treasure God or treasure stuff. And, th- and there's no other alternative. There's no middle road. If you, l- if you treasure money, it's the root of all kinds of evil. Through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, Jesus is, is saying, watch out, be on guard. And he doesn't use this lang- language with any other kind of sin. He doesn't say, watch out for adultery. Why? Because you know when you're committing adultery. It's like, whoa, when did this happen? She's not my wife, right? Like, blah. (laughs) Greed sneaks up on you. When you least are aware of it, when you least expect it, when you least anticipate it, when you least are watching for it, it creeps in and begins to sow its little tiny roots in your heart. And all I know is that the only antidote is to say, God, you, uh, you need to be my treasure. You need to be my treasure. Solomon prays this in, 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 in Proverbs 30. I love this prayer, right? Solomon 30, uh, Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. He says this, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches, right? I don't want to go to these two extremes, but feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I fall be full and deny you and say who's the lord or lest i be poor and still and profane the name of my god i mean this is literally what psalm uh, solomon's praying he's saying god i don't want so much money that i forget my need for you but neither do i want so little that i'm tempted to do something that would dishonor your name give me just enough to meet my needs i'm going to tell you right there that is a biblical perspective He who does not provide for himself or his family is worse than an unbeliever, Paul would say to Timothy. But how much is enough? How much is enough? Point number three. Jesus tells a parable, the ridiculousness of greed. Ridiculous. It is ridiculous when you look at the parable Jesus tells. There's nothing wrong with this man's success. Look, notice verse 16, 17. I mean, if you, if you kind of walk through the parable, there is nothing wrong with a, a, a banner year. Crops are greater than they've ever been. Woohoo! Jesus doesn't condemn success. This man came about his wealth honestly. He's not shady in the sense of stealing from people, right? He's not looking out for the widows and the orphans and taking advantage of their plight. This man is, is successful, and we need successful people. We need successful businesses. We need banner years when it comes to crop harvests. Amen? The problem comes when this man is not thinking about anyone more than himself. Think about it. The pursuit to want more and more will never make you alive. It will never make you happy. It will never make you fulfilled. There's a show on TV called Hoarders that illustrates this. Has anyone ever seen Hoarders? Why are we so intrigued by this? Maybe maybe we identify with it, right? Like, here's the thing with Hoarders. There's always two people involved with the intervention. You know who those two people are? On one hand, there's the organizer who deals with the what. Thousands of gerbil cages. We don't know why. <laughs> so the organizer comes in and he's like, hey, here's what is going on. Got to get rid of all the junk. But the second person is the psychologist who deals with the why. What is going on in the compulsiveness of this person to collect all these gerbil cages? What is going on in the heart of someone that compels them to do this? And, and, there's, and you have to have both because you can't deal with the what if you don't with, deal with the why, right? Because then all you get the next day is rinse and repeat over and over and over again, right? And so Jesus is saying that this has nothing to do with the possessions, the wealth, what this person's accumulated. The, the problem is with the heart. God has always aimed for the heart, right? Where your treasure is, that is where your heart's going to be also. You know who said that? Jesus! Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. You see, this man 
has developed false confidence. He has developed false security. He has developed false comfort. He has developed false coping. He has overconsumed at the expense of his soul. Three things under this point that we need to, to talk about. Number one, he missed the source of his prosperity. He didn't revere God. He didn't revere God. The issue isn't that this man's fields prospered. The issue is that God wasn't his supreme treasure. He wasn't rich toward God, right? This is why God says, you fool. Psalm 14, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds, and there is none who does good. Now there may not be people who outright, don't walk around outright saying, there is no God! But I tell you what, they live like it. And there's a lot of probably practical atheists. There's probably a lot of Christian atheists too in the church. The wrapping paper looks Christian, but the more you take the paper off and see what's inside, it's a, it's a heart that says, God's not my treasure. See, God has blessed this materially. Just the right amount of rain, just the right amount of sunshine, just the right amount of depth for seeds to be planted in the soil, just the right nutrients to be in that soil, the strength to even tend to the land. If you think about it, how much God is involved, the fact that God sustained that man while he slept so the next day he could get up, maybe have a little bit of breakfast, he had his oatmeal, he had his juice, he went out into the field, he had the mind to know exactly what to do with that field, the weather, the, the health, all the things that this man, the, the, the fact that the crops had no disease, there was no pestilence, right? If you think about it, how much is God involved not in this man's life and his harvest, but our lives each and every day? And yet, how often do we not acknowledge him? You are where you are because God has designed you to be where you are. He has given you the capability to be where you are. Don't sit there and go, well, it's my college degree. You wouldn't have a brain if it wasn't for God. You wouldn't have synapses and neurons firing the way they do. You wouldn't have the certain proclivities you, you have if it wasn't for the fact that there's a God who's designed you. Even when you were in your mother's womb, he intricately wove you together. Did we not sing that this morning in Psalm 139? Think about this, you guys. He was a success in everyone's eyes but God, the very one who is the author of his, this man's life. Boy, do we not take that for granted. He was success in everyone's eyes. And here's the dangerous thing. So many times we associate success with spirituality. And this is even more deceitful. He's a success in everyone's eyes. He probably, he could have come to church and everyone been like, yeah, John's here, woohoo. This guy, he's a rock star for God. You're a success in everyone's eyes except for God's eyes. When you don't acknowledge him, when he's not your supreme treasure. The man did not stop to think Thank God to acknowledge God with what he had. Notice how the pronouns just in these few verses. I, my, I, my, I, my, I, my. Come on, join me. I, my, I, my. Twelve times. Twelve times. Me, myself, I, the unholy trinity. How many of you battle with that, that, that group? So he missed the source. Number two, he missed the uncertainty of prosperity. He didn't understand himself. There's an identity issue here where he is play, planning and he's preparing for things that he is uncertain about. Think about how much this comes into play when it comes to our lives because, again, it's not the rich man's diligence that God rebukes here. It's his foolishness in his sense of self-sufficiency P pursuing security in what he can store up on earth. This man was a master of tilling the soil, but he was horrible at tending to his soul. Again, you could be successful with what you do, what you put your hands to, what you achieve, what you accomplish, and you can become masters at all of our little hobbies and all of our jobs and and yet, the most important work anyone can avail themselves to is this, tending the soul. 
Yeah, it's the very thing we, many people forsake. He counted on material wealth to sustain him. Think about it. I'm planning for the future, so I have possessions I will store up over there. And not only do I have future possessions, but think about the future pleasures that those possessions will bring. Do you hear what he's saying? Ease, comfort, eating, drinking, Netflix, ball games. Woo! Right? Like all the, it's hedonism. Do you know the term hedonism? Hedonism is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. Yeah! So I've got my possessions. There's my future right there in that barn. And if I just keep it supplied, all these pleasures are mine. Do you see the sense of false security? Do you see the sense of of false comfort? Do you see the, even the, the false coping? Don't people spend money and get greedy because they're trying to cope with some sort of lack inside? Right? Don't look at your wife. Don't look at your husband when I'm talking like this. Your life consists of more than your money. Your life is more valuable than your possessions. Let me say a, a word, and, and some of you might hate me. I, I don't make it a goal every Sunday to find something where you're going to hate me over, but this might be it today. This is the only place in the Bible where retirement is spoken of. And here it is in the context of disapproval. Because the kind of retirement that we tend to buy into is very unbiblical and immoral. Let, let me explain myself before you get like all defensive. Retirement in our usual vernacular is a ticket to hedonism. Biblically, retirement should be a ticket to evangelism and discipleship. Right? We send all of our older folks, seasoned people, into their own little communities where they can play bingo and shuffleboard their way into eternity. And God has a different picture in mind for the older men and the older women who can still be used of God to bring people to Christ and help them grow in Jesus. Retirement is not a ticket to hedonism. It is a ticket to evangelism and discipleship. Right? Because... The world is going to lead us on the path of, of shallow thinking. The world is going to lead us on a path to short-sightedness. I mean, think about the sins that are involved in all of this conversation, whether you're retired or not. There's selfishness and there's covetousness. Right? These are sins that God wants to do in all of, work, work out of all of our hearts so that we can pursue things beyond just the hedonistic pleasures that your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus is pursuing. I don't want you shuffleboarding yourself into eternity. I don't want you yelling, bingo, <laughs> and die in your country club, right? With all the other Agnes's and Marvin's and aren't those great older people's names? Harvey and Wanda's and whoever, right? He sought ease, comfort, eating, and drinking. What's wrong with that? Nothing if there is no infinite valuable God and no resurrection. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 32. Look at this. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and tomorrow we die. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Like Paul, by, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, cites the same phrase Jesus just mentions here. And let me just tell you, if there's no resurrection, eat, drink, because tomorrow you die. Hedonism. But if there is a resurrection, live differently. Amen, church? Wow. Do you treasure God more than you treasure your riches? 
Because here's the, here's the kicker. Third point. He missed the purpose of prosperity. He didn't love others. He didn't love others. Here's what's really cool. Zach and Sarah share their testimony, right? About their 20 cars and animals destroying their cars and, you know, awesome, awesome stuff, right? Like things that at the moment you're like, I don't stop. But notice what they said. We are debt-free and now we can share with others. They said, I didn't put them up to that. This is what happens when you free your life up from the, the love of money and indebtedness to, to companies like MasterCard who really do master your lives, right? You're not known by name. You're known by a number. They don't care, but yet they're willing to give most dangerous words in all the world, right? You are pre-approved. Dangerous! Don't buy it. Because when your heart is free from the love of money, your heart begins to become free to loving other people. God prospers you so that you can love others. You have been blessed, now be a blessing to others. He doesn't give you a raise to increase your standard of living. He gives you a raise to increase your standard of giving. It's one of my favorite phrases. You're thinking, I got extra money. And our first thing we think about is, what kind of car can I drive now? Literally, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. I drive a 16-year-old car. 165,000 miles on it. It's awesome. She doesn't think so. She's in the passenger seat going, don't you think it's time to get a nicer car? And I looked at her and I said, no. Why? Because when I pull up to every other driver on the street, guess what I can do? I can roll my window down and go, guess what? It's paid for. <laughs> it's paid for. Is that, that is like the best way to flex this, in a, and hopefully not a too much of a pompous, prideful, cocky way. But how many people have car payments? Worse yet, fleeces on their cars? Because that's what it is. And guess what? I can roll my window down, and I can go, it's paid for. My wife has got XM radio. She goes, don't we want XM radio? I'm like, no. I'm fine with the broken antenna and just a few FM stations. I'm fine with that. Why? Because what excites me more is the fact of what can I do with the extra that God has given to us not to lavish upon myself but help bless others. Now, I'm not going to tell you I perfectly live that out every day. Don't think I'm walking around like, that guy is just the most generous person. No, I, I wrestle greed in my own heart. But what excites you most is what's going to drive you and compel you to do certain things with your finances that either free your soul or damn your soul. What excites you most? Do you get excited about blessing others? That's the generosity is the cure for greed. And I would tell you, and I even mentioned this the other day with somebody generosity is really the new evangelism generosity is that thing that people are waiting for those who claim to have god as their treasure i.e christians to 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 live out and to demonstrate because non-believers are moved by generous people and especially when they have a motive that says i want to honor god you don't know how many conversations I have here at the coffee shop with people over the topic of money that then leads to the gospel. More than any other topic, money leads to the gospel. Because it's not about what God wants from you, it's about what God wants for you. Because I'm talking to guys who are working 80 hours a week and they haven't seen their kids or their wives. And I'm talking to women who are so successful in their careers, they are just seeking to buy the next big thing. And you can just look at the emptiness it's not truly life. It's not truly life. I mean, look what Jesus says later on, verse 33. It's not on the screen. It's, it, Luke 12, 33. We're going to get to this next week. little appetizer for you. Sell your possessions. So here's what Jesus says, right? Here's the antidote. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make for yourselves purses which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes nor moth destroys for where your treasure is. That's where your heart's going to be. What's the antidote? Generosity. What's the antidote? Cleaning house. What's the antidote? Start selling off stuff. What's the antidote? 
like Dave Ramsey says, start getting rid of stuff where your kids fear they may be next. You're going to get rid of me too? Maybe. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. Throughout history, if you study civilizations, every culture recognizes that using creation for strictly selfish ends leads to destruction and distortion. Every civilization, and those that don't, destroy themselves. You can be destroyed by affluence. So what do we do? We use what we have to bless others. Wealth is not to be hoarded, but to be used. And we have a moral responsibility to share with others. First John says, how dare you claim to have fellowship with him when you see a brother in need and ignore it? Your faith is deceived. Jim Elliott, one of my favorite quotes, missionary 50s, died taking the gospel down to South America. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. The fool is the hoarder who doesn't treasure God or love others. He is no fool. She is no fool who gives what you ultimately cannot keep in order to gain that which you cannot lose. And guess what? If a person won't distribute his or her resources to others in life who may be in need, God's going to do it after you die. <laughs> That's the rude awakening. Right? I just read just the other day, this French philanthropist just left millions and of dollars in his will to a museum to feed the 50 cats that live in the basement of this museum. Number one, cats are from hell. Number two, sorry for all you cat lovers, I pray for you guys, I mean, I honestly do. But secondly, can you imagine the mentality of someone with so much wealth saying, this is where I want to designate my riches. Keep the cats fed. Think about what we're going to leave behind. And some people make a choice to spend it on eternally valueless things, but guess what? If you don't choose to determine where your money's going to go, someone else will do it for you. Point number four, what's God's reaction to greed? <laughs> you fool! Boom. This very night, your soul's required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? This man's security is brought to nothing by one sentence from God. Right? He's got all this planning and preparing. He is, there's so much sweat. And, and God just brings this man's life to nothing with one sentence. I mean, this guy went to sleep totally confident about tomorrow. He's like, I'm going to get up early and go play golf. And at about 12 o'clock, I'm going to meet some friends at Postino's. And then at 5 o'clock, I'm going to grab some happy hour with some friends. And then tomorrow night, we're going to come at, at home and we're going to watch the you know, new series that's on Netflix. And he's just got his whole life scripted up. But at 2 a.m., he has a heart attack. No golf, no Postino's, no Netflix. Here's the fatal flaw in this man's situation. He prepared his life without preparing his soul. And the parable ends on a note of tragedy. Who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Because they're not yours anymore. This is his worst nightmare. nightmare as is the nightmare for greedy people, because greed is inherently competitive. This is why James Carville Famous political writer says, the person who reaches the summit of, of accumulation of wealth, does not they're not happy when they reach the summit. They look around to see who they beat there. It is inherently com competitive. And the worst nightmare for the greedy person is the fact that they will, if you remember back in the day, there used to be a bumper sticker, he who has the most toys wins. Not in God's economy. Back to the cynic Solomon, Ecclesiastes 2. Look what, look what he says. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master for all which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. 
right? This is, this is scary. This is, this is scary. The, the times you, you played Monopoly. Let me just tell you, I was Monopoly champ growing up in my home. And you know what? To, to, to seize that corner where you got Park Place and Boardwalk and Baltic and Mediterranean, so you got the slums, you got the high rent district. But if you control that corner, guess what? It's so good. And then my mom and dad will always tell me, guess what? You won. Good job. Now put it all away and go clean your room. Because in the end, it all goes right back in the box. It would be foolish if you saw me at Target. I don't stop there. I, I like Target. Walmart. But it'd be foolish if you guys ran into me at Target this week, Walmart this week. I'm pushing around a cart, and it's just loaded with stuff. And they're like, getting your shopping done? I'd be like, no. I actually don't have money to buy all this stuff. I just thought I'd walk around the store <laughs> with all this stuff in my cart. You guys would be like, you're weird. As if Sunday we didn't think you were you're, Now you're really weird. Walking around a store with a pile of stuff in your cart that you're not going to ultimately leave with because you can't afford to buy it. James 4, 13 through 16. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go to such and such a place or town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Why is this important? Can I just tell you right now? And this may totally determine attendance for next week. We're not done today. Some of you are like, really? We get to, we get to be slapped around next week? Yeah. Because this is too important a topic. Why? Because here is the conclusion, verse 21. Because the greatest thing you can invest your time and treasure and talents in is this, being rich toward God. Here is the reason. To be rich toward God. The scariest part in all this, and I mentioned it before, is the blindness to our own condition. That greed is so insidious that, that it creeps in and yet we buy the lies subtly, slowly. And in the end, we, we end up treasuring stuff and not the supreme treasure God himself. Don't die rich in this world and poor toward God. Don't. This guy was rich towards himself. Bigger and bigger barns. And yet I love what C.S. Lewis says. You know, Lewis shows up. He who has God and everything has no more than he who has God alone. Let me say it again. He who has God and everything has no more than he who has God alone. We need frequent reminders. This is why once a year we spend time talking about this. Because you don't want to make 2020 worse than it already is. You want to go into 2021 better equipped, better prepared, not for what God wants from you, but for what God wants for you because your aim today, tomorrow, 2021 is how do I make my life richer toward God? That is the end-all, be-all goal of all of our lives who claim Jesus is Lord. How do I become richer toward God? Because I don't want you en- ending up with an empty soul or an empty life. It would have been totally different for this man if he had God in view, others in view. Our lives, our goal is to turn t- material earthly goods into eternal riches if this man prayed god this is all yours you have made my field prosper show me how to express my riches that you are my treasure and the riches are not i already have enough i don't need bigger and bigger safety nets I don't need better food, better drink, better parties. I do indeed want to make merry with people, but not self-indulgent partiers with rich retirees. 
I want to make merry with the people who have been helped by my generosity. I want the fullest blessing of giving because you have taught me, Lord, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And all God's people said, that's what I want for me, my wife, my kids, for you. True life is not in having things. True life is in knowing God. Spiritual poverty is what Jesus is getting at here. Hoarding money without compassionate giving. Poverty. Regarding property as one's own and not God's. Poverty. Basing one's security on possessions rather than God's provisions. Poverty. How will you today maximize God as your treasure? Supreme treasure. Only treasure. So I was thinking about this. Came up with four words. Write these down. Number one, intimacy. Intimacy. I want you to be rich toward God in intimacy. So now I'm aiming for your heart. Intimacy with God loses its value when we fall deeper in love with money and wealth, and possessions. You can't serve both God and money. Who said that? Jesus. If you fall in love with one, you will fall out of love with the other. There's no middle ground. Philippians 3.8. Paul says, I'm going to count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Intimacy at all cost. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I may Christ gain. There's joy in loss. There's joy in loss because the loss of things that don't bring true life are, are good things to lose because you're replacing it with, with the one who truly does bring life and that's relationship with Christ. Second word I want you to write down is this, death. The person who is rich toward God is the person who understands death is not the end. See, this man assumed he'd be alive in the future and he would enjoy the things he has stored up for himself. But little did he know that there's this thing called death that we will all face one day. And I just met with the guys Friday morning. So there's a men's group that meets here. Six, shameless plug, 6 a.m. Friday mornings. We have a great time. We talked about this last Friday. N broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Meaning you're not bringing baggage with you when you meet God face to face. You, you, you're going naked and it's okay. He knows you anyway. <laughs> I shared a story of a of a, I used to do some spelunking back in the day down near Tucson. Anyone ever been to the Pepper Sauce Canyon in the rabbit hole? You guys, no one knows about this? Okay. So there's this place, you go into the caves, right? Totally dark. And then you go back, go back, and then there's a spot called the rabbit hole. It's probably 10 to 15 feet long and about that big. And you, all you can do to get through is just do this. Maybe grease yourself down a little bit. But by but going through the rabbit hole, you don't bring anything with you. You don't bring anything with you because you can't get through. But once you get through with nothing, you open up into this cavern where there's an indoor huge pool you can swim in and stalactites and stalagmites. It's glorious. But you can't see this beauty unless you're willing to strip down to nothing. That's what death does. You get through with only your soul. How will you have prepared it? Third word, judgment. Oh, I hate that word. Judgment. You will be held accountable for everything that God has given to you. And the judgment will be this. Did you use it for things that matter in eternity? Or will you have squandered everything on the temporal pleasures of this world to meet God with nothing to account for what he's entrusted to you? That, that's a sobering thing to consider. 
1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about this. He says, some of you are going to build with the materials that are going to last for eternity, gold, brick. Some of you are going to build with things that are going to burn, like wood and hair. And, ugh. You're going to make it through as a crispy critter, but you're going to have nothing to show for your life. Last word, kingdom. Why is this important? Because there's only one kingdom that will last for eternity, and that's God's kingdom. And as sons and daughters of the Most High through Jesus Christ, we're to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and then all other stuff will, will, will come, come about. But there's, there's one priority. See, this man built bigger barns because he thought his kingdom would last. And in a blink of an eye, his kingdom toppled. Are you seeking God's kingdom? Put your wealth and finances and possessions to use for God's kingdom, for the ministry of the advancement of the gospel. So, so men and women can be equipped and have the resources needed to spread the news of Jesus. I praise God that we're part of a church. We send money to Mexico. We send resources to India. We, we bless churches in Slovenia. Why? Because we see them as good investments because they are eager to take the gospel to places. We are eager to see the gospel advance here. That's why we're not going to store up stuff here. That's why we're talking about potential expansion down the, the plaza here, which is still in the works, just for some of you know, because I get texts from you, hey, where are we at with that expansion thing? Hey, still working on it. COVID, that's to say, COVID. But we're not storing up just to, to, to hoard. We want to use things wisely for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a worthy investment, church. Amen? To see men and women come to know Jesus and fall in love with him. That's the greatest investment. Invest in God's work. Invest in the church. Invest in blessing others. And all God's people said, Woo! We made it! And no one walked out on me today. Yay! Let's stand. Let's pray. It is, it is good to come before you Father, in the name of Jesus, and, and want to ask you to weed out all the, 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 the greed that may exist. And, and we know it's not a one-time work. Sometimes it's a daily activity just to, just to check our hearts. We, we don't want anything to become more prized in our hearts than you. We don't want to exchange anything in this world that we may deem as valuable or someone else may deem as valuable. We don't want to exchange it because you are more than valuable. That, that word treasure is such a good word. Forgive us for the ways we have treasured stuff and we haven't treasured you. Lord, help us to be rich toward God. And may our lives be a testimony so that when others see us, they observe us, they watch us, that they would somehow know that stuff isn't our treasure. You are our treasure. Lord, I am looking forward to a future of more and more generous people. Lord, we are seeking to do this for your kingdom. We are seeking to do this for the sake of eternity so that not only would we be openly, joyfully accountable to you, but that we may have others with us as a result of generous people seeking to save those who do not yet know you as the treasure through Jesus Christ. So Lord, be glorified in our lives. Guide and direct us and give us wisdom for our daily living. And, and may we always keep you in view as our supreme treasure. Thank you, Father, for loving us. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Love you guys. Have a great, great day. We'll see you soon, all right? Bye-bye.